This second part of the afternoon takes a slightly different form, and we're going to look at, be looking at um, two particular projects, because we're moving on, having uh, looked at in interpretations this morning and identity and self-fashioning against particular contexts in the earlier part of the afternoon. Um, we're looking at, the, at collections themselves and the, and the way we um, interpret those collections to audiences. And following on, I think, rather nicely from, from Dr. Correa's um, uh, talk uh, earlier on, we have uh, a group of speakers. Um, they'll be doing their joint tap dance up here around the mic uh, from the V&A. And uh, this is Bronwyn Cahoon, assistant curator of photographs, Janet Brown, program manager for Black Heritage and Culture, and Lucy White, the learning department coordinator. Um, as I say, they're all from the V&A, and they're going to be talking about a particular project um, called Staying Power, which looks at, um, it was set up to increase the number of black British photographers and images of black Britain in the V&A collection, and how to uh, interpret those to an, to an audience, co complementing the photographs in, in interesting ways. And so I will say no more, but ask uh, those three speakers to, to come up and uh, wow us with this, this wonderful project. Over to you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Lucy White and I'm Learning Department Coordinator at the Victorian Albert Museum and Project Manager on Staying Power, Photographs of Black British Experience, 1950s to the 1990s. I'd like to begin with a brief overview of the project and its original aims and outcomes, and then I will hand over to Bron to discuss the curatorial strategy and the exhibition component, and then finally to Janet, who will look at the public programme and oral history strands of the project. Sustaining Power is a partnership project between the V&A and Black Cultural Archives that began in 2008 under the Heritage Lottery Fund's Collecting Cultures programme. Over the last seven years, the V&A has worked with BCA to acquire photographs either by black photographers or which document the lives of black people in Britain, a previously underrepresented area in the V&A's photographs collection. With funding from HLF, the project acquired 118 photographs taken by 17 artists during the second half of the 20th century. The original aim was to collect between 25 and 35 photographs, however the budget allowed the project team to acquire far more than originally anticipated. The photographs have become part of the UK's national collection of art photography housed at the V&A and raise awareness of the contribution of Black Britons to black, to black culture and society as well as to the art of photography. In addition to collecting photographs, the project aimed to recruit and train volunteers to conduct oral history testimonies from a range of subjects, including photographers themselves, their relatives, and the people depicted in the images. A total of 39 volunteers submitted a form expressing their interest, and from this, 31 were recruited, of which 23 completed training in oral history interviews and detailed summary writing. The project collected 21 oral histories ranging in length from 30 minutes to two hours, and these are now part of the permanent audio archive at BCA. The culmination of the project was two free exhibitions shown this year, showcasing the photographs enhanced by over 50 excerpts of the oral histories. Originally, the project was going to run one exhibition at BCA. However, due to the volume of photographs collected from the project, the team decided to run an additional display at the v &A. The first exhibition opened in BCA's gallery from the 14th of January to the 31st of July this year, and the second display ran concurrently at the V&A in Gallery 38A from the 16th of February to the 24th of May. Across both sites, the exhibitions were visited by over 48,000 visitors, and this was 38,000 more than originally anticipated in the original application. Over the duration of the project, delays were encountered due to the construction work on BCA's new building located in Windrush Square in Brixton. As a result, the project was extended a further two years to allow the exhibition to be held in the new gallery space once building work was complete. To ensure the project continued momentum running up to the opening of the exhibitions in 2015, additional public events were programmed. Originally, 13 public engagement activities were planned with an anticipated visitor figure target of 400 participants. In total, 55 public and educational programmes were run across BCA and V&A linked to the project and permanent collections with over 6,000 visitors attending. 
In addition to the exhibition, Oral Histories and Events programme, the project aimed to create a website for staying power, and this was achieved by providing information online about the project, photographers and oral histories hosted on dedicated web pages of the VNA website. The project was also required to run a training programme, and this was delivered via an internship for a project cataloguer. Training was provided by both organisations in archive material and interpretation, documentation processes and collections management. In particular, training focused on object cataloguing through creating and editing object records and examined what cataloguing means, what information we record and where, in accordance with the VNA minimum cataloguing standard. At the end of the internship, all of the artist's biographies and public access descriptions were successfully completed with supervision from staff at BCA and colleagues in the Word and Image Department. I'm now going to hand over to Bron, who works in the Image um, and Word Department and who is Assistant Creator on Staying Power. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so, when the Staying Power project began in 2008, a very small percentage of photography in the Venus collection reflected the significant impact that people of African and Caribbean descent had made on British heritage and society. The HLF Collecting Cultures Fund provided a good opportunity for us to address this gap and actively prioritised developing a coherent group of work that reflected the black British experience. The Staying Power project had two key aims from a collections and curatorial point of view. To increase the number of works by black British photographers and images of black Britain in the V&A collection and to raise awareness of the contribution of black Britons to British culture and society as well as to the art of photography. The photographs collection at the V&A covers the history of photography as a fine and applied art medium. Comprised of over 500,000 photographs, it is one of the largest and most important in the world. It is international in scope and ranges from the medium's invention in 1839 to the present day, illustrating a vast range of processes, techniques and subject matter. The v &A was the first museum in the world to collect photographs, beginning in 1852. Six years later, an international exhibition of photography was held, the first at any museum. The museum began collecting less than 20 years after the invention of photography and in many cases sourced acquisitions directly from the pioneers of the art. As such, the 19th century holdings are unparalleled for their depth, quantity and quality. The collection continued to grow into the 20th century, building significant holdings of modern European and American masters. It was designated the National Collection of the Art of Photography in the UK in 1977, and since 1988, contemporary photography has been the primary focus of collecting. The Staying Power project has a strong art historical element in terms of situating the collection of photographs within the wider history of photography and celebrating the contribution of black Britons to the art of photography. However, there was also a strong social component that became more evident during the oral history project, which Janet's going to talk about a little later, in which photographers, their relatives and their subjects were interviewed. The two strands of this project are reflective of the various approaches and pathways to understanding these photographs, many of which are portraits. They also reflect the interdisciplinary nature of the photographic medium, its artistic, documentary and communicative capabilities. In total, we acquired 118 photographs by 17 different photographers, both prominent and lesser known. The photographs range in subject matter from fashion, style and community to identity, politics and protest. The photographs were sourced in a variety of ways. Many were acquired directly from the photographers themselves, whilst others were acquired through agencies and galleries such as Autograph ABP. The majority of the photographs that were collected fall under the discipline of portraiture. However, many challenge traditional notions of portraiture by also drawing on other photographic traditions. For example, Norm Ski documented British youth culture in the 1980s and 1990s by taking portraits of individuals and groups in and around London. However, these photographs are also good examples of street or fashion photography. In a similar manner, Al Vandenberg's photographs from the series On a Good Day largely hover between portraiture and street photography. Vandenberg's portrayals of London in the 1970s focus on the people that make up a city rather than the places within it. Although made on the street, the photographs are carefully composed and the subjects present themselves head-on to the camera with ease and confidence. 
He used the street as his studio, carefully positioning subjects against a variety of backdrops, including shop fronts and buildings. Neil Kenlock's photographs of African Caribbean families in their front rooms bear a strong reference to studio portraiture. Photographs like this were taken for the sitter to send to relatives in the Caribbean to show that they had settled well in Britain. The compositions of these images showcase the variety of material goods families owned and the modern homes they had made for themselves. The images evoke the styles of the 1970s and the somewhat eclectic decoration of many British Caribbean sitting rooms during this period. And actually, when we were um, when we displayed these this group of photographs in the um, exhibition, um, it was just wonderful to observe so many people um, really kind of relating to the photographs and uh, you know. Um, reminiscing about that they had the same carpet or the same curtains, and uh, it was just wonderful. Um, um, similarly, James Barner's studio portraits of members of the local community taken in Ghana in the 1960s informed the photographs he later made when he moved to London. But what connects all of these portraits is their ability to tell a story. This story was further emphasised by the oral histories that were collected from the ph photographers, their relatives and, their sub and the subjects. The Staying Power project enabled the v &A to tell the story of black people in Britain from different perspectives, through photographs, oral histories and events that were organised throughout the course of the project. From a cur curatorial point of view, this was realised further through two exhibitions that were organised simultaneously at the v &A and at BCA. Together, the exhibitions displayed over two-thirds of the photographs that were acquired um, and represented every single photographer that we acquired work from as well, or acquired work of. The interpretive strategy includes a slideshow of the photographs, accompanied by excerpts from the oral histories. This was a relatively new approach for the v &A and was very well received. The oral histories gave voice to the photographs, enabling visitors to find different pathways to understanding the images, and also prompting a reflection on their own experiences. The exhibition attracted over 37,000 visitors to the V&A in three months, and throughout that time we observed a diverse audience engaging and identifying with the photographs in different ways. <coughs> This photograph by Armut Francis was selected as a powerful lead image for the exhibition at the V&A. The photograph was taken in 1964 in Francis's home in Bromley, Kent. As Francis sets up his shot in front of a mirror, he consciously, consciously records himself as a photographer whilst offering an intimate glimpse into his world. This photograph really epitomises the key themes of the exhibition and also the wider Staying Power project, that of identity and self-representation. Here we see Francis, a black man, in the very act of depicting himself. I'll now pass over to uh, Janet Brown, Programme Manager for Black Heritage and Culture at the v &A, to talk about the events programme and oral history component of the project. Thank you, Bron. Activities ranged from discrete workshops, for instance, for 10 elders, in Brent at a community centre exploring migration and the photographs of their lives with photographers Joy Kingston and Othello de Souza Hartley, to 2,000 visitors at a garden event with DJs Gladiwax, Tighten Up Crew and MC Champion exploring the history and heritage of Blue Beat Ska and Rocksteady music that spanned the 50-year timeline of this photographic project to a two-day conference that examined identity and experience within photographs um, with contributors who were activists, DJs, style image makers, curators, journalists, art collectors, oral historians, and the staying power photographers themselves. The three examples that I'm going to show you um, that I've picked out um, are kind of my sort of favourites from the whole project. And you're thinking, oh my God, seven years. Well, it's the last five years um, of this seven year project that um, looked at um, um, a whole sort of a, a, a array of events that took place. Um, but the reason why I'm showing these, first of all, is because they depict the target audiences that um, the project wanted to work with, youth, 
families and adults, and also the participants at the time of the projects when they were taking place were visibly moved um, by their experiences, and a lot of them had a lot of hidden outcomes, such as better communication amongst families, pride in sharing stories and experiences, and they embraced and value and they embraced the value added of engaging with a museum. So the first project at Youth Clubbing was a two-day workshop with the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. And with this project, it was quite significant because it worked with Earls Court Youth Club, which was a predominantly white youth club, and Goldbourne Youth Centre, which was predominantly black. And they both knew about each other, but never worked or met each other. So we use this as an example of bringing the two groups together to collaborate on a project that where they could share their experiences of youth clubbing and what they enjoyed about youth clubbing, but through their photographs that they took themselves. So for me, they're not the best photographs in the world, but what they are, are a true representation of what they thought was important to them and how they wanted to represent themselves. And these are just a small selection of the photographs they, they took that they selected themselves. The next project is a family project. It's called Contemporary Cushite Kings and Queens ooh, um, with Croydon Supplementary Education Project. And this was a, a project that looked at working with a supplementary school and looked at the way in which they um, wanted to work with their young people and families in terms of representing their culture, um, looking at sub subjects and topics of blackness that they would not necessarily learn or gain from formal education. So the idea was for them to look at their own identity and identities of the past that kind of, uh, I suppose, shape their, their, their current situations and their future. So um, the following photographs are a selection of, the, um, of this um, workshop. It was a two-day workshop. The first workshop took place at Croydon Supplementary Education, um, ran by somebody called Kandachi Chimbiri, who wrote a book called Step Back into Ancient Kush. Kush is um, now a certain, part of, a, a certain part of Sudan. And we looked at ancient kings and Af African kings and queens um, from that and looked at the roles and responsibilities they had at that time and also the kinds of things they were wearing and they wore a lot of what we call regalia. Now we don't have Kushite regalia at the V&A but we do have um, Ghanaian regalia from the 1874 pu punitive raid on Kamasi. So when they came um, for a visit to um, the v &A on their second day um, we had a curator who talked about that gold regalia. And from them, they had a two-week um, window of opportunity to make regalia for their families. So these are the results. You can see the parents are wearing the regalia. And this was an amazing, this was, I mean, parents were in tears. You know, um, you know older siblings who were, weren't talking to younger siblings because they were bothering them in their bedrooms and they didn't want to be bothered, kind of thing, came together and actually had discussions about the project. On the second day, parents, they wrapped up in cloth, they brought outfits, every, they, were, they were serious about this project. And the idea of the project was the siblings, the young people made the gold regalia. They led the project. They also styled their parents, told them how to sit down, how to pose, things like, mommy, hold your head up. You're not looking proud. You know, look at this. And then they worked with Edda Cherry, who worked a lot with us. Um, he's a photographer, filmmaker, and um, wonderful workshop leader and they could see the image in a computer screen. So they could look at the com in the computer screen and decide whether or not they liked that shot. And then that was the shot that they took and it was connected to a camera with a, a snapper, so to, think, so to speak. So they took these photographs. They also came back to the museum for a third occasion for what we called a museum day, where we hung these photographs in the Sackler Education Centre, had an opening for them and gave them a, a great day at the museum so they could engage with, in, um, with museum life. The first two events that uh, projects took place with very little collected staying power material because you had to then start the project workshops according to the, 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 the bid that was written. This particular um, uh, um, event 
um, like a lot of the events that then took place when the exhibition, both exhibitions were up, um, took place at the Black Cultural Archives um, in their gallery space that showed um, 24 of the photographs um, that, were, that were acquired. This event, I called it Representation, Afui Narratives, 1950 to 2000. The term Afui means it is ours, it is for us. So it's a very Car African Caribbean term. term. We say things like Afui things, and we say things like that. So this was very poignant. And we had radio stations called Afui Radio Station, which was a kind of a, a kind of a, um, Oh, one of those, um, what do they call them? Um, illegal radio stations that played music that black British people would like to hear that, say, the BBC oh, wasn't playing at the time. So that term is very, is very poignant. So this event um, took place at the BCA. And the, re the idea of this, um, I asked Dr. Michael McMillan, who, um, playwright, writer, curator, artist to chair this session for me because what I wanted to do with this was to have have him treat the exhibition space like a living room so these 24 photographs were photographs in his living room and there were 70 people 70 participants visitors who racked up for this um, being toured around the whole history, the 50-year history that um, Stay in Power was about. So he could draw on his own personal experience with his family coming over from the Caribbean, um, right up through SUS, through all the politicisation, through some of the, the wonderful work that we've seen, some of the images of um, people like Neil Kenlock, who was um, a, the official photographer of the, Black, the British Black Panthers. But on, on, on another um, stance, he was also taking photographs of people in their homes because it was about black pride. Um, and part of this story, as he went around, was, um, juxta was, was um, juxtaposed with stories from four of the photographers themselves, Charlie Phillips, Jenny Baptiste, um, James Barner, and um, Neil Kenlock. So as he went around and told this story, they could, actually in, um, they, they could actually talk about their own work, their own practice, what was going on at the time when they were taking those photographs. So they kind of added... Um, a, a more essence to the actual story. So this is um, Michael in, um, in action. So they're just three um, types of events that we did. But we did lots of... We even did an event called Stay in Power Unseen, where we had the Stay in Power photographers come together and they showed work that was not acquired as part of Stay in Power because they wanted to have a moment where they came together as photographers because a lot of them had heard about each other but had never met each other until they actually became part of Stain Power. James Barner, an oral portrait hidden. James Barner is 86 years old. He is the oldest photographer of all of those photographers whose works were captured. And each, not all the photographers, but quite a, a number of photographers had uh, their oral history recorded. James's oral history spans 65 years. James um, has said, one, at the age of 79, I was recognised. He, was at a, he was addressing an audience um, at the Chelsea Theatre in 2013, and he was explaining things about his life and his work. And at the age of 79, he said, at that point, he was recognised. So seven years ago, James began to see a change in his status and being recognised for his 65, 70-year career as a photographer. James's oral portrait, so therefore the recording of his, of, 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 of his life, I would say, was about two and a half hours long. It covered the work that was collected or acquired at the v &A, in terms of his photographic work and his career, but it also covered work that he did that was also in, um, that he did for magazines like The Drum in Africa, where we have back, full back catalogues of that at the BCA. So it was trying to capture two things at once, staying power and as a donor at the Black Cultural Archives. James's oral portrait is meant to engage audiences in learning and accessing his life in a recording of just over two hours, as directed, relayed, represented, and interpreted by him. 
His, like many of the other staying power photographers with long and hidden careers, took place without the luxury of an adoring public acknowledging his milestones, learning from his, his techniques, understanding Ghana and the UK through his work, and the many missed opportunities for celebrating recognised achievements and accolades, hence the importance of capturing these important life and career narratives. And I should say here that Margaret Busby, who is um, a writer um, and um, a publisher, um, wrote a Wikipedia entry for James Barner that went live in October this year. So now you will find there's lots of stuff online for James Barner through Autograph, through the Black Cultural Archive, and now he has his own Wikipedia page. So he's riding high. That's one of the other terms that he says to, said to me. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to say with, with, with the oral histories, the oral histories were there to capture um, the life of um, the artists as, and, and also about the work that they made and, the, and, and to kind of talk a little bit about the photographs that were collected. But it's a bit more than that because a lot of these phot um, uh, photographers have had 70 year, 45 year careers. Even Jenny Baptiste, who's one of the youngest artists, has had a 30 year career. And it's a bit like Jenny Baptiste, who's she? So people sort of know who she is now. So it was important to capture that life um, on, that, on those recordings, which you can actually listen to at the Black Cultural Archives. I'm now going to talk a little bit about the oral history process. We had to recruit um, a number of volunteers, have, give them training, so that they could conduct exhibition and online ready material from the photographers, families, and the subjects within the, um, the images. They had a day and a half's training um, led by someone from the Oral History Society so they could be certificated. So it was approved training. We ran learning sets for those volunteers because even after one and a half days of training, you still don't know how to necessarily use a Zoom recorder. So we set up learning sets where I provided tea, coffee, juice and biscuits threw the bag of stuff down on the table and said, there it is, get on with it. And they had to sit there and teach each other with the Zoom. So they had to, and they had all the, the um, information that they had on the training, but they needed to actually be confident with the material because I didn't want them to go into an interview going, I'm not too sure which thing to press, or does that sound right? I wanted them to, to have that, no, no fear. I wanted them to be able to use a Zoom recorder the same way they pick up their phone, the same way they use a remote control and a TV. So it was important to get them to that level. Why? Because they had then, they had to use their own creativity to create the questions that were asked, that, that they, they posed those questions. They looked at the work of the artist, they researched those um, photographers, looked at the, um, the, 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 um, the images, so that they could actually produce the questions. We had questioning sessions. I created an aid memoir of questions that they had put together, I had put together, the trainer had put together, so that they weren't lost. And if they didn't like the question, they could actually, instead of fumbling around, they could actually rearrange the question to suit the person they were going to, um, to interview. Those questions were given to the interviewee so they could be, they, to check that they were happy with what they were going to be asked. I didn't want them to have any surprises. Um, and um, we had sessions where we looked at the agreement. Those volunteers were more scared about the agreement than actually doing the interview. It's a bit like, oh my God, what if they don't want us to release that information until 100 years after their death? I said, well, there's nothing we can do about that. None of them did, but they were more fearful about asking people to sign an agreement. Um, we had image viewing, um, sort of discrete image viewing. So we had all the photographs there every time we had a session. Not because I wanted them to choose, but you, they started to have conversations amongst themselves about which photographer's work they actually quite liked. So they started to kind of identify themselves with particular phot photographers in terms of interviewing them. And the training also gave them extra sessions on creating summaries and, and being able to transcribe, because it was important that they were able not just to take, to make the recording, but they had to be able to write a summary so that the curatorial teams on both sides could look at the summary, 
at a quick glance, see which bits they might want to listen to, read that in the full transcript and then listen to it from the recording. So that was really important. Um, the, um, as I said before, the, um, the exhibition and online, the curators received the recordings, the summaries, the full transcripts, and highlighted the extracts they required for each exhibition. These were then cleaned up and, um, and the sound evened out nicely um, by um, somebody called Alex Flowers, who's our head of digital team at the v &A. And so they were exhibition ready. And I edited the extracted transcripts for the recordings that went online. So when you listen to the, there's an online, there's little snippets online that you can, um, you can listen to. And finally, for those volunteers, they now have a skill that they've used many, many times on lots of events that I've run, where I've got the public to come and look at the Stay in Power photographs and have, the, to make, and have their own oral histories t um, taken, and uh, events where we've asked visitors to bring photographs within that period and talk about their lives. So now, what the, the, the sort of like, I suppose, the legacy for those volunteers is now that they're working with the Black Cultural Archives on donor collections. So the Black Cultural Archives has donors who donate material to the Black Cultural Archives. And now those volunteers are now interviewing. They're looking at and unpacking those boxes, looking at the work of those donors, formulating questions, and actually are now interviewing those donors. So they have a skill for life. 